simply what we normally think of international relations, which is probably diplomacy and to a certain level journalism. It goes far beyond that. So before we begin discussing that, let's, let's see who else is able to join us. And, um, um, and we'll discuss, I, I keep looking at this little cloud that goes, has an orange button that goes on and off, on and off, which I think is the, the link that says that we're recording the phone call. And I keep thinking, am I having a good hair day? <laughs> Yes, Dr. Munoz, you look great and uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon for everybody who has joined us. Uh, due to respect of the timing, we are already 9.07 here in Switzerland. So I'm uh, uh, Ina Kapirska. Uh, I am representing business to business department in, in uh, University of Business and International Studies. Uh, we are starting our uh, webinar uh, about international relations, changes and opportunities. Uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Rodrigo Munoz, who is uh, director of our research institute, and uh, our colleague from uh, Spain, Mr. Daniel Rura, uh, who is in charge of uh, partnerships and uh, UBIS uh, campuses around the world. Uh, I uh, am uh, very glad uh, uh, that uh, you could join us today. Good morning, Daniel. Thank you for morning, being here. All. Uh, floor is yours, uh, Dr. Munoz. Uh, we have uh, two partners from the agents, and uh, we are recording this webinar to be able to send for those ones who were not able to join. Uh, floor is yours, and uh, I wish you good luck, and I hope uh, we will have some questions uh, to discuss. Hey, Anjana, where in the world are you, by the way? I'm from Nepal, sir. From Nepal? Yes, Kathmandu, Nepal. How wonderful. Uh, we really have a specific region here present, which uh, for me is incredibly fascinating. I think, I think that the first um, question that we need to look at is why international, international relations? Why international relations is relevant whether we study it in its practical applications and by force also on its theoretical level. Um, and it's important to acknowledge and to make it clear that unlike many domains which have very clear parameters, um, international relations is ultimately a multidisciplinary area of study. It encompasses history. It encompasses politics. It encompasses economics. It encompasses sociology, and a group, and many more ologies. So, when you study international relations, you acquire a set of tools that permit you to conduct high-level analysis on a multitude of level. Uh, they lend themselves to not only analyze issues related to, for example, nuclear war, but also issues relating to human slavery in the 21st century, to issues of the relevance of dental hygiene. Ultimately, all of these issues in one way or another may appear to be intellectually separate, but there are linkages that uh, are important to acknowledge. For example, you might think that the current pandemic is ultimately a health crisis, but it is also quite clearly an economic crisis. It is quite clearly a sociological crisis. What is the nature of the society that is going to emerge in a year or two, or perhaps even longer. And it is clearly an international relations problem. For example, right now, uh, we have the possibility of a vaccine being rolled out on a global scale. That is wonderful. But does this mean that we will be able to return to the socioeconomic model in which travel was nearly unrestricted 12 months ago, 14 months ago. 
For that to happen, there's a series of treaties that will need to be worked out. Details will need to be worked out on which vaccines are recognized around the world and which ones are not. Uh, some countries, for example, the, the Emirates are rolling out the Chinese vaccine. Some countries, Russia and others, are rolling out a Russian vaccine. In the United States, we have two vaccines, which is Pfizer and Moderna. In the UK, you have three vaccines, uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca, and so on. Uh, an agreement will be needed to be reached among different countries to recognize the effectiveness of all of these uh, um, vaccines before we're able to return to the world we knew before in terms of our capability to travel. That is clearly in the bailiwick of international relations. If you get vaccinated, what document will you need in order to board an airplane? Already, certain countries and certain airlines have intimated that probably after the second quarter of this year, only those people having a vaccine passport will be permitted to travel to those countries or board those their national airlines. What is valid proof? All of this will be hashed out eventually by members of the international community, uh, utilizing the good offices probably uh, of a UN agency and probably IATA. But recognition is not going to be uh, equal across the world. So we find ourselves in a very exciting moment um, that requires a high level of expertise in international relations. And that expertise can be applied not just to government, but to business. Uh, two, uh, the two domains which UBIS uh, tries to present to, your, uh, to those who you will be recruiting in the near future. Uh, Daniel, any, any thoughts on that most obvious uh, dimension of both business, uh, my passion, international travel, tourism, um, and the opportunities and dangers for the international business community because all of these events have both positive and negatives. I, first of all, good morning to all. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning, Nigambar. I'm, I'm based, morning. I'm Daniel. I'm based in Valencia, in Spain. And there are several issues that I have been thinking about international relations. I mean, as long as we work with Dr. Munoz, we, I'm also having a background in international relations myself. So we tend to discuss a lot about the, the current issues worldwide. And one of the things that is calling my attention the most is the big challenge that we are facing with climate change. Um, coronavirus is to some extent a, a, a problem with climate change. Uh, here in Spain, I'm not sure if you have been following the news uh, there, but we have a very, very strong snowstorm that cover half of Spain uh, for at least almost a week with snow, which is completely not normal. The changes where the, the, the climate, the, the, it's changing and this is posing a very serious, serious threat uh, to, to, our, to our economies, to our political system, to our stabilities. And I'm not sure if we are able to, to catch what uh, the, the dimensions of, of the potential consequences. Uh, and this is going to affect business. I mean, I'm on my own, my, my, my other background, I studied a, an MBA in Paris too. So for me, the, the connection between international relations and business is very clear because the ability to do business across the globe will be to some extent very, very restricted by the damage that is we are causing to the, to the, to the climate system. So. This is something that is going to be affected, and this is something that can any particular government cannot solve it by itself. So it's not the government of India saying we are going to solve the climate change in India. It's not the Chinese government going to say um, 
that they are going to change it by themselves. This, this will require a very deep, a long term and deep engagement from all the, all the countries. We are trying, we have been trying, the world has been trying uh, to set agreements since probably the beginning of the 90s, but the success is not, it, it's, it has been kind of minor until this point. Only the, the, the well-developed economies, because they have the resource to do it, are able to, to commit to stronger measure and even they are not reaching uh, very, very important, important goals. So this is something that, that concerns me the most. In international relations, we always have two kind of trends. We have the, like the long-term trends, things that we can see over a long period of time, and we can see how it evolves, like climate change, but also we face um, everyday uh, issues, we say short-term trends. <clears throat> In these cases, we are, we are facing a very challenging year because we have several short-term uh, goals or objectives that we need to accomplish. Uh, first of all, it's trying to, to recover from this pandemic. First of all, cure uh, all the people who are currently uh, sick. Today, we have the news that the coronavirus has reached uh, two million deaths. So that, that's a major, a major, a major issue that we need to, to recover. And the second issue that we will need to tackle is economics, because the, a lot of countries have, have entered into lockdowns, harming the global, not, not only its economy, uh, its particular economy, but also the global economy is, is going to see a downturn. Therefore, after we are able to, to let the pandemic behind, we need to take care of, of the economics. And connected to the economics, we will have, or we may see in the near future, social instability. Uh, because the, the, the combination of the two crises, what happened with coronavirus plus the economic crisis. And we have seen um, recently the events in the United States, which is a combination of a long trend of social fracture within the United States and um, the crisis caused by, by the pandemic and, and, and these like of fractures that we can see over society. So there are some interesting things that are going to happen during 2021 and probably 2022 too. Uh, and there are also remain there also our very key and, 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 and trends that have been there in place for, for a long period of time that we need to face them. For all this, and especially in international relations is needed. This, we are people trying to see different aspects. If an international relations specialist, sorry, if a specialist in any discipline, let's assume a doctor, let's assume an engineering, they are specialists calling, they know a lot about a very tiny spot in the discipline. We are more generalists. We know a little bit from a wide range of disciplines. And that gives us the capacity to understand and to analyze the, the different issues of the, of the global politics, economics, and social trends. Therefore, I see, I foresee a very in future for international relations professionals uh, that are connected to all the, these kind of issues that are uh, shaping our new world, so to speak. Ori, if you, if you have any other comment on this? I think it's also important to point out that these international relations experts that Daniel talks about are not people who are simply going to be part uh, of the foreign ministry of your country. They will be people who will be working and need to have a presence at any organization that looks beyond its own borders uh, for insight, for ex positive and negative examples, uh, the needs to interact with other cultures and other ways of thinking. And that basically includes uh, pretty much every economic activity. Uh, one would think that perhaps agriculture would be one activity that is very much focused on uh, within the state or within the locality. But the reality is today, agriculture more often than not is international in nature. Whether you're, just, you're producing uh, onions in Uttar Pradesh, you're still affected by the international system. 
Um, you need to think about the fertilizers that are needed very often. Uh, there is international standards for them. If you do not follow those international standards, you cannot, ex you cannot export those products. Um, climate change, as Daniel pointed out, is something that will not leave any single country unaffected. India, for example, depends on the monsoon for its agriculture. Well, the monsoon, as we have noticed in the last 10 years, is not as stable as it once upon a time it was. And the arrival of the monsoon two weeks later than usual has incredibly negative consequences to the capability of the local agriculture to meet its targets. If the monsoon is unusually dry, it affects the capability of, of the actual production of agricultural products. If the monsoon carries too much rain, the same, perhaps even worse disaster occurs in which the loss of much of the productive capacity is lost. A country, you would think that a country like Nepal, high in the mountains, would not be affected by climate change. But it is, we already seen the number of glaciers uh, significantly diminishing uh, in, um, in Nepal. Uh, the way of life that has sustained a human community at high altitude is in a certain sense in danger. And unfortunately, it is in danger for activities in which the Nepalese have had little impact on, on its occurrence. Uh, and if the Nepalese are willing to make the necessary sacrifices to transform their economy, it is regretful to say the, the impact that you will have on global, war, global climate change will be minuscule in practical terms, but not in moral terms. This is why addressing this issue in small states and in big states, as is the case of, of India, of the subcontinent, of China, of the United States, uh, is so important because uh, in the process of modernization, uh, there's a series of issues and because of the very size of your countries, your impact is tremendously large. And I, and I think this could be part of a separate conversation uh, concerning uh, the direction the globe is taking. Uh, good morning, James. Uh, what part of the world are you in? In New Zealand. Hello, James. Uh, wonderful to have you here. And. Uh, and New Zealand is, is certainly one of those examples that we take in international relations as best practice in terms of your policies towards climate change, in terms of your policies towards a multilateralism and so on. Uh, thank you That's for right. being here. Thank you. Uh, My privilege to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, we're certainly very interested in uh, having as diverse a, of a student body at uh, UBIS, having as diverse body of interlocutors who understand the realities of, of this beautiful planet that we're all part of. Despite the fact that we live in a world of nation states where a New Zealander and a Nepalese and an Argentinian and a Ukrainian may see the world from very different perspectives because at the end of the day, how we see the world depends on where we're sitting in both terms of economic and social standing. At the end of the day, this big blue planet is our home. And very often, solutions require concerted efforts. And that's the bailiwick of international relations as Daniel pointed out. Yes, Ina. Uh Dr. Munoz, I have some questions from the students. They are WhatsApping me. And uh, uh, you were mentioning uh, uh, economic uh, crisis and also the climate change. Uh, I had a student uh, yesterday on campus. She arrived uh, recently from Pakistan and it was uh, for us surprising, surprising that she finally could get her visa. Actually, this is uh, in the uh, uh, dimension of what you've been saying in terms of travels and restrictions. Uh, 
if uh, we are talking about uh, tourism business, uh, uh, how do you think much time it will take to overcome uh, this crisis in tourism? Some experts, they are given about seven years uh, for tourism to get back to the level like um, tourism business had in uh, 2019, let's say, at least in Europe. What is your opinion about this? And uh, uh, then I will uh, ask another question. Uh, let you. me start with uh, tourism is not, I'm an expert in tourism as a traveler, as a consumer. I'm not necessarily a, an expert on the data that is populating the current conversations uh, on the topic, but I can say the following. Uh, IATA, as you said, uh, which is the international association that uh, groups all of the travel industry, particularly the airline industry, has come out with a seven year proposal for a normalization, but that prediction is predicated upon the rollout, the successful rollout of a vaccine, and that, that vaccine is adopted by significant numbers uh, of the local populations of every country. Now, when we think of tourism, though, on a global scale, we are really talking not as a, on a global phenomenon. We are principally talking about the developed countries, and we're talking about a, a certain group of destination countries in the developing world. Uh, and then there's a couple of countries that have an outsized impact. Uh, India and China due to their population base may be developing countries, but when you have over a billion people in your population and you have a 10% of them who have international capacity to travel and to consume a high value tourism goods, you're talking upwards of 100, 150 million people. Um, that's, that's, that's extremely significant. Um, like, like, I, like I mentioned at the beginning of, of my statements, uh, a lot of this will depend on the harmonization of travel documents because we will be needing a travel vaccine or some type of proof that you are not, uh, that, you're, that you're not capable of spreading the disease. I think we're moving right now to test that will be able to give feedback on whether you are test positive or negative within 30 minutes. In the Canton of Geneva, which is where I reside in Switzerland, has, has at this moment not approved that test because the level of accuracy is not high enough in its opinion to be utilized, but uh, plenty of labs are working quite quickly because there is a tremendous financial incentive to develop this type of technology. Uh, will it be enough? I think that it will be part of a group of measures that will be necessary, um, including the vaccine, including rapid tests and tracking technology. So I, uh, going to the future, I see a loss of privacy if you want to travel extensively. Uh, one that I'm willing to, to negotiate with. I mean, I'm also a big believer in, in privacy, although all of my students tell me that that ship sailed a long, long time ago. Um, and again, this is again, something that falls in the bailiwick of, of international relations. Seven years, no, I, I think we will be, we'll see an uptick uh, towards the fourth quarter of 2021, at least for business travel, for leisure travel. Look, there's people who have never stopped. It's all a matter of to see what the influencers in TikTok are doing uh, very often quite irresponsibly, but people yearn for human interaction. People yearn to, to meet other cultures, to, to gain new understanding that is currently a dangerous proposition for oneself and perhaps more importantly for the local people in those areas that, are, that have less capability to respond to medical emergencies. Uh, absolutely, it can be a bit, of a, a bit irresponsible. But uh, by 2022, I hope that I can travel to five, six countries per year as I normally have done in the past. 
And obviously, recipient countries need to open their borders. Right, James? Uh, yes, yes, Professor. Yes, they would. Uh, I think uh, New Zealand is still uh, in, in uh, trying to see what they can do best to sort of have the trans-Tasman uh, travel and uh, uh, you know, borders open for the trans Tasman so that we can get Australians coming in, which is almost 60% of our uh, our travel and tourism. But I think right now the focus um, uh, is more on domestic travel. You see a lot of Kiwis now actually going and visiting places that they used to not do before. Um, so I think in most countries, domestic travel is something that's becoming the, the intrinsic focus of most of the governments because they have to keep the hospitality industry alive. And I think, again, the focus on carbon footprints and other things where, uh, you know, um, uh, you encourage people to do the right things. Because one of the, one of the things that this uh, COVID thing has done is probably reduced a lot of carbon emission. And, uh, uh, you know, the carbon footprint has reduced quite a bit because months on end, there's been a lockdown. So uh, that is, that's been good. But I don't think New Zealand is really going to open its borders till 2022. Um, uh, because every time we seem to have uh, tried to open the borders, we've had a couple of cases and we've not been able to manage community outbreaks. So I think there's a lot of things that you just spoke about in terms of, you know, whether it's uh, management of uh, uh, the isolation and quarantine procedures, uh, management of privacy, uh, seeing which countries to open their borders to, um, how to manage all those things, everything is going to make a big uh, big difference. So I think most of the countries and the governments are going to be changing the way they handle tourists going forward. I'm completely in agreement with you. And I think, uh, again, all of this points out the importance of continuing our studies in international relations because they provide a necessary insight and gives us the ability to look to the future while also looking at the past and try to identify trends that the international system will be following moving forward. Uh, Ina, yes, uh, I, yes, go ahead, James. Yes, I just would like to point out one thing in terms of international relations is what I've seen, and though I, since I work with New Zealand immigration as an immigration advisor, we've seen that a lot of these countries now basically look at the same platform and actually exchange information as to how they are looking at student visas, how they are looking at uh, deportation appeals, how they are looking at visitors coming in. Uh, so all these um, uh, biometrics that have come in uh, is something that is helping people share information around the world. And I think at least the Alliance countries are all uh, basically doing that is sharing information, sharing information on various, various things uh, around the world. It's not only regarding the COVID and what, how every country is handling COVID, but it's also regarding travel, tourism, people movement is a big thing now. Absolutely. And, and it requires coordination at the international level. It requires trust among states that the information they provide about their own citizens will be utilized with respect and discretion. Uh, again, this, this is a, a very important area in which a, having a deep understanding of international relations uh, will provide um, positive examples of how to move forward. Yes, I agree, yes. Daniel, I have a question uh, to you. Actually, uh, we have some students from uh, uh, former Soviet Union countries, and they are uh, comparing um, this pandemic and also uh, uh, COVID uh, to a Cold War. Would you uh, agree or disagree uh, with them on this point? Uh, do you think it's another type maybe of information war, like in terms of international relations, how we can uh, uh, emphasize uh, in this dimension? Let's start for, from the from the very deep of the international relation. There is always, always a struggle for power, a fight for power among the great powers of, of, of the world, United States, China, Russia. Luckily, since 
the end of the Second World War, there has not been a major war between the great powers or Russia and the United States never went to a direct conflict. And moving forward in time until our days, the, those kind of wars have shifted the nature. So there are no more major military wars, but the, but the war still keeps there because there is always struggle for power. So therefore, we will see a, a kind of war, indeed could be named as a kind of Cold War in different fields. The first of all, it has been named by a very, very important scholar of IR in, in Europe called uh, Mark Leonard, what it's called the connectivity wars, okay? How the, the hacking in, uh, in the servers or in the, in the sites of uh, sensitive government uh, agencies of each other country is becoming a, a, a daily a daily routine, so to speak. And now we have also the call on the, the, the kind of cold war with the vaccines. We have Russia who put who named uh, its vac its vaccine with Sputnik, which Sputnik has been the the icon of the uh, uh, rush of the space uh, race. So that's that, that's telling you something that's that's made out of propaganda it's 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 not only that russia is trying to to to, to sell the vaccine and put that a, a, a name like a branding uh, the vaccine but it's also the importance that russia is giving to the vaccine for them it's another tool of foreign policy so there are some countries now in the world uh, that are receiving the, the vaccine. One is my own country from Argentina, and they are giving the, 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 the Sputnik vaccine. And there is a war there who is leading the science and technology. So far, we have seen the success of the Western economies and the Western countries. Again, the three first approved or massively approved by the two most important bodies, which is the um, FDA and the EMA in, in United States and Europe, respectively, uh, have been the, the, the ones developed by the Western societies. But in reality, there is a, there is a very interesting thing here. In 1918, we had the Spanish flu. For that, uh, for that flu, we never, we actually, we never knew the virus. We knew that it was a virus coming from pigs, mutated to people, but we never were, were able to, to, to develop either a cure or a vaccine, the virus just went off and then disappeared. Therefore, that was, that, that, that was the way how the Spanish flu ended up. Today, that was completely different. In January, 2020, we precisely knew the virus. We were able to map the genetics of the virus and we knew it exactly. So that was a huge improvement and there was not Western economics involvement there was China with all the critics that we can pose on China on the way they handle the vaccine. But in reality, their science body, they were able to identify the virus, to map the genetics of the virus and share it with the colleagues. So labs all over the world were ready to start and work on the vaccine already in January. And that's a major triumph for China and they, are, will, they will try to sell it that way too. But there is always a struggle for power and they will use every single mechanism to try to fight. I'm not sure if you remember the first stages of the pandemic when it firstly hit Europe, China was sending aid to Europe. I mean, when during centuries it was the other way where a cooperation and humanitarian support was sent by Europe to the rest of the world where we saw here in Europe big, big shippings with uh, uh, cargoes coming with aid from China, for, with help from China uh, for, for, for Europe. So that was basically very, very, very important in terms of diplomacy. And this is, has always been a, a struggle of power and whatever it's going to happen, we'll have some sort of um, side of a political side with the struggle of power. There, is, there, there are no good or bad intentions. In IR, we always say they, they, they don't have good or bad intentions. They have interest. They have national interest and they will pursue it. Doesn't matter whether they seem nicer or tougher. All of the countries and 
even more the major powers, they will have always interests and they will, they will use each single thing that is happening to try to pursue their own national interests. I, I think very valid point there, Daniel, but one of the reasons this pandemic is what it is today is that there are global treaties that, op that, make, that obligate every country that is a member of the uh, World Health Organization to report these type of viruses in a prompt fashion. The delays that occurred in China, the refusal to provide access and the blocking of the pandemic resolution by China uh, perhaps have made a problem that could have been handled quickly into a pandemic that is going to be with humanity uh, forever, much like the flu. We're not getting rid of COVID-2. It's going to be around for all our lifetimes, unless there's some major uh, technological breakthrough. This, is, this problem is gonna be like the flu. Uh, the head of Modena uh, two days ago at a conference sponsored by a major uh, American bank simply stated, this is not going to go away. This, is, this has reached such a proportion that there will be pockets globally and the mutation rate will continue so that it propagates itself every year, much like the flu that we have today. Uh, so it's, it's, we are moving into a very different world than the world that existed um, 14 months ago. And I, I agree with you that China has done much to mitigate, but one of the requirements is greater transparency and quick action rather than protecting the national interest, the national reputation, to think of the global consequences of not being transparent. All right. I, I, that would be a good I, I, place there. I, I, I just mentioned the, the just small, tiny thing that they decode the, the genetics and they share it. The rest of the pandemic, how they handle it, it's, it's just, just terrible. I mean, I totally agree with you that the level of the, the proportion that the, this pandemic has arrived, it has a, a very important part of fault on China and how they handle it at the very early stages. And even and they, today, we are seeing that there has there is a mission of the WHO going to China to investigate the, the, the origins of the virus, and they are facing some opposition from the Chinese government to access the country. So well, is, they were kept out of the country for over two weeks. And, and during those two weeks, the Chinese government is negotiating what questions can be asked, exactly. what uh, information can they gather and take back to their headquarters. That is, again, a diplomatic uh, negotiation taking place, which is the bailiwick of international relations experts. Uh, and, and I'd even go a step farther. I'm not sure if anyone has realized it, but this week it was announced that the next head of the Central Intelligence Agency is not going to be a spy as has been in tradition. It will be a diplomat. A career diplomat will be taking over the Central Intelligence Agency, which again un highlights the importance of diplomacy. Uh, that intelligence today is not simply about surreptitious uh, information gathering or public information gathering, which is reading the newspapers uh, in every country where you have a mission, but also establishing linkages among perhaps often competing intelligence services because the challenges to the nation states today are global in nature, diffuse in nature. Yes, the United States and China are going to continue having tremendous conflicts over the sparkly islands in the middle of the China Sea. Uh, the, they will continue having significant conflict over whether Taiwan deserves to be under status quo, which is what the United States pushes, or it, it is a renegade province of China. These things are not going to disappear. But the points 
of cooperation need to continue being developed. And that is something that international relations experts have always pushed. There are many areas of conflict, but there are many areas of uh, cooperation, and we need to continue making progress in all those areas where progress is possible and isolate, compartmentalize those areas that it is a little more complex to move forward. And, and I see the, the, under the new president of the United States that there will be a more internationalist push uh, hopefully a positive one that will bear results within the first year because the globe cannot afford to have its principal players, United States, China, the European Union, uh, Russia, India, not in accord and working toward goals that are the common benefit of humanity. Ina? Uh, Dr. Munoz, I have actually a question uh, uh, to both of the speakers, uh, because uh, one of the sectors that was mostly affected uh, is education. So in this uh, uh, regard, uh, how uh, this change from on ground to online education, what it is going to bring us? Uh, will maybe education will be cheaper to deliver maybe it will be harder or easier to make uh, interactions uh, to build network uh, what is your opinion uh, i would rather not express myself on, on this question but i will give some general trends if a student is interested in education any and all modalities will be successful it's a matter first and foremost about passion, desire of the student. So whether we're talking about an on-ground experience, whether we're talking about an at distance online experience or a blended opportunity, the level of motivation of the student will ensure success or failure. In terms of cost, I think um, to ensure let me take a step back. The gold standard remains face-to-face -face education. But what has this last 12 months, 14 months uh, done is create a, an refined and provided feedback and data, which is being incorporated into the body of knowledge and producing new solutions continuously, that it is possible to have quality online education. It has required retraining professors. It has required uh, retraining students, uh, coming up with new tools to verify the students are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing, uh, doing their readings, doing their assignments, etc. It can be significantly more difficult for a professor to do so online but technology is coming in to help in, in this area. So I'm optimistic that in the next three to six months, we're gonna see incredible developments in online education that will breach the gap. Uh, for me, ideally, uh, it's a blend of the two. A little bit of online, a little bit of on ground is optimum, but I see no real disadvantage in a motivated student in any of the modalities. Uh, Danielle, I think you deal more with international students than I do. Uh, what do you think about the potential of online education? And, and, and let's face it, human beings today are the same animals that descended into the plains of Eastern Africa some 200,000 years ago our modality of communication, our modality of building relationships is, is still the same one. Even though your generation thinks, seems to think that uh, a friend on uh, Facebook is a real relationship uh, and quite the same thing, someone you spend hours each day interacting face to face with. Uh, I'm a little older than Danielle by about three years Okay, maybe a little bit more, uh, <laughs> uh, but 
might take on relationship building. And let's face it, education is relationship building and transmitting knowledge uh, poses challenges. But perhaps uh, I haven't delved as deeply as you have in, into these modalities because I do know that you are successful in maintaining deep, rich relationships despite distance. Please. Uh, online education or distance education has been with us for a long period of time already. This is not something new. We, we had the first experience late in the 70s, the first big university with online system with distance education in the 80s in the United States. Therefore, there, there are online and distance education has been always been there around us. I think the pandemic just moved forward some time. I mean, when we were expecting to be doing probably in 2025 to 30, we are doing it in 2021. So that, that's, that's the, fir the first reflection. And for me, online education, well, talking what we are having now, it has three, three main questions that it has to, to solve or to answer. Or when we are, other way to, to see this is whenever we look at a program which has, um, which has a online education, we should ask to the program or should, we should evaluate three variables. For me, accessibility, flexibility, and quality are the three main characteristics we should assess on every single single, single product that we are offering. Uh, accessibility, where, where our students can, can study. Coronavirus made it very clear. Can they study from home? Can they study um, uh, from, from where? From where I can access the content? And, and it's, it's always available. It has some breakdowns. It, it, I need a lot of technology. I mean, technology gaps have been very clear, not only between different countries, but, be, but also within each country, we, it, it was crystal clear that there are still some, a lot of a big gap between people who have some sort of digital skills and access to certain technology and those who, who, who don't have it. Therefore, the accessibility is one of the key features of, of online distance education. That when, whenever we face a problem, we say, okay, okay, this problem is accessible or not. The second one is flexibility. Do I need to stick to a scale, very fixed? I need to join a Zoom class eh, eh, every single day, or can I review the videos by my own? Can I work? Can I start? Can I, can I start my own business and study? How can I eh, possibly merge? Uh, my daily life, which has also changed because of coronavirus. Perhaps I lost my job and now I want to, to, to start my own business uh, alone or my family or with a friend. So I will need time to, to, to start to develop that business to generate my income. Uh, but I also want to keep studying. Um, or perhaps I now need to work more because my company has, it's in problem, it's in trouble. Um, and I need to, 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 to help uh, with, my, with my job, but still I want to keep studying. Therefore, I, I cannot invest four hours per day, for instance, during some session uh, on the computer. So I, I, I prefer something more flexible. So how flexible is the, is the solution in place? So first of all, accessibility, and second one, flexibility. It's, is that solution flexible enough uh, to allow me to develop myself while studying. And the third one, uh, the last but not least, it's the quality. What are we providing to our students? Uh, it, it's relevant for the field. It's, it's, it's where they want to develop themselves. Uh, it is going to help them not now, because I don't care about the jobs they are doing now. We are, we are caring what they are going to do in 10 or 15 years, where basically, the jobs that they are going to develop in 10 to 15 years are not yet invented. So quality is measured now because they, I will give them tools to do the, good, the job good now. It's because I, we are going to provide certain skills that will help them to be trained to, to, to change and to relearn uh, for, the, for those jobs who currently uh, don't exist. So for me, whenever assessing a, a program, are those the, the three keys that even ourselves as a team 
achieve is we, we consider each time when we develop a program, we, we develop a, an educational solution, which are accessibility, flexibility, and quality. Uh, thank you very much for the answers. I think we have about seven to ten minutes uh, before we finish. Uh, maybe if our participants have some questions to the speakers. Please uh, go ahead, ask, and uh, uh, we will be able to reply. We don't bite, so feel free. Anyana, James, uh, Digambar. So we have Nepal, Nepal, New Zealand, and India. If I can just make one statement uh, while you guys think of questions, I think Daniel really hit it on the nail when he stated the three points which need to be evaluated. And at the end of the day, when I take a look at the courses that I at least deliver in, in international relations and the program which I designed for the university, uh, the most important and valuable um, skill set that I provide my students are two. And one of them is critical thinking, the ability to evaluate information, the ability to uh, analyze and identify what the interests are of those who are putting out information. And that's something that will serve individuals regardless of what they do, regardless of where life takes them. The ability to understand and view the world with an eye for accuracy. Because in this world of massive information dumps, having the ability to find the grain of wheat among the shaft is critically important, whether you are in banking, whether you are in international relations, whether you are a decided for a career in journalism or education. Anything and everything you do requires the ability to engage with information and determine its quality. And that perhaps is one of my biggest uh, issues with a lot of my millennial students. They simply look at a, at a blog and say, well, it's gotta be the truth. You know, this, this person has a million followers. He, he must be right. And I've, I've gone often into the exercise. Okay, let's look at the original source quite often you end up finding that it's a circular argument. It's people referencing people who are referencing the same people. So there is no real source. Uh, Ina, in her earlier career, trained as a journalist. For a journalist, the gold standard is multiple quality references that acknowledge that the information is correct. So this is something that we share with our students. and, and I, and that certainly the most valuable skill set, and this is certainly a skill set I see in all of our programs, is the ability to understand what the problems are, to understand what the relevant questions are. And even though the student at that moment does not know the answer, he knows how to find the answer. And that's what I want to develop in all of my students, whether they be bachelor's, master's, or doctoral level. The ability to identify the pertinent questions and the skill set to know how to find the answers. If, if that's all I've done uh, with a student, I think I have achieved the most, in person, most important mission of any educator. And that's when it really becomes a privilege to interact with students because uh, students who were very passive at the very beginning of a course become very active and question me as the instructor. And that's when I know that I have engaged them when they're willing to, to question my authority. And that's a lot of fun. That, that's what makes me get up every day and, and teach to, to students and makes me get up every day and read copious amounts because it's necessary to continuously be enhancing your skill set. I don't know how you take it, uh, Daniel. You taught some courses 
in different parts of the world in completely different cultures. And I think uh, in some of those cultures, you as the instructor are seen as a deity, if you will, who cannot be questioned. And I'm pretty certain that by the end, uh, hopefully you've transmitted this idea that authority Challenging the authority, but it's interesting because we we are very used to, to, to challenge authority. We encourage our students to challenge authority, but not just for the sake of challenging, but with data, with facts. Uh, and by encouraging that to them, encourage them to, to do that, we also pose a very big burden on us because we, as Rodrigo said, we need to be up to date, read, uh, and be relevant for them to provide the, the knowledge they, they, they need to have. Um, and this, but I think Rodrigo made a very important point, which is it's not only important to have the knowledge, but to distinguish the knowledge, knowing what to do, knowing, knowing where to go and find the data, which is the correct data. Uh, data is available for all of us now. The, the important skill is determining which data is valid or not. And that's a very, very, very important skill that we need to provide to our students. And that Rodrigo mentioned it. When, whenever we enter into a classroom, we are not thinking to, to deliver what they are going to be using as a knowledge. What we are thinking is what tool I can provide them to, to look for the data, analyze the data, and understand how to structure a, a, a right answer. So that, those are the challenges any, any faculty are facing and way that you is, are trying to train our faculty and to constantly have a dialogue on them on how to, to build these kind of skills to our students. Dear speakers, uh, uh, thank you very much for wonderful uh, presentations and uh, your opinion. Uh, uh, you've been covering not only education, but also tourism, economic, uh, topics uh, you've been covering international relations uh, Rodrigo your best quote that I resume for myself would be education is building relationships <laughs> and uh, from uh, Daniel I really uh, liked also these three dimensions uh, about uh, accessibility flexibility and quality uh, Rodrigo I think that if you are given uh, critical thinking to students and uh, their mindset is built up in a professional way. Also, uh, you develop their competencies for the job market. If they will be, you know, viewing the world uh, with accuracy and uh, if they will be able to analyze the data and uh, identify uh, the interests of uh, the ones who gives the information, this is really uh, uh, something important uh, that uh, uh, we give to our students uh, from the start of their career. Uh, I think uh, there are lots of questions uh, to be raised uh, due to pandemia, and uh, I think it's uh, really great that uh, UBIS has never, you know, we didn't have any stop, any day a stop, uh, uh, and uh, uh, we all uh, uh, provided uh, in uh, three more volume uh, the education uh, to the students, and that's why it was a big uh, jump in terms of recruitment and in terms of uh, people who joined UBIS uh, during last uh, two semesters. So uh, due to the quality and our professors expert, uh, our agents and partners were having an opportunity to have a trial lesson today because this is exactly the way we are providing classes. This is exactly the way we encourage the discussions in the classes. And uh, if we could uh, be useful in this regard, uh, I think uh, you guys done a great job and uh, I'm really thankful for participants and for the speakers to be able to join us today and uh, uh, this was wonderful discussion, at least, uh, uh, you know, there are interesting topics uh, for the future to be discussed and uh, I'm, I'm happy we had the uh, time and I hope you enjoyed. Uh, thank you, Ina, for this opportunity to reach out to people who have such a key role in the UBIS family. Uh, we, we like having quality students. Uh, we like having 
people from varied backgrounds. I think I speak not only for international relations department, but also for the business department, the, a plurality of understanding of uh, the future, uh, of how the world works, uh, what the a plurality understanding of what our needs as human beings are, enriches us. And for me, that's one of the great values of boobies. Uh, currently in excess of 40 or 60 nationalities among our student body and professors, uh, brings a wealth of cross-cultural pollination that I think highlights the best that is possible uh, moving forward. Whether, whether we like it or not, the moment where the nation state it was the hallmark of the international system where people only looked within their own country probably past some 30, 40 years ago. Uh, young people moving forward will work multiple jobs throughout their lives and very often, uh, and, and I hope it happens, will live in multiple countries, experience multiple cultures. And, and that is a, a very positive development because the solutions to the global problems require that the next generation is more international than ours. They recognize with great empathy, great sympathy, the needs not, not only of those within our own boundaries, but the needs of those on a global scale. So thank you and very much for your efforts into injecting that, that level of internationality to UBIS. You really are playing a, a fabulous role for us. And uh, sometimes we may forget to, um, to tell you, but we truly are thankful for the quality and internationalization of our student body. Thank you very much. Uh, we will be finishing right now and I will uh, wish you to stay safe uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, uh, take care of you and your families and uh, you know, positive start of the new year for you and have uh, great days. Uh, let, let, let's be together. <laughs> we are here to support you. Thank you and goodbye. I'm finishing the session. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day. Thank you very much. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank you.